If you were to go to a uh, military museum or battlefield, you would find many different types and varieties of weapons and, and armor that would be on display. It would depend, of course, upon the era and uh, the war that was being fought, but there are certainly different kinds of armor and different kinds of weaponry that is displayed. And those weapons and those armor reminds us that there was a life and death struggle that was taking place. Uh, these weren't, uh, these, this wasn't something that was used to, to role play. It wasn't something that was used to play games. It wasn't something that was for a comic con. Uh, these were for real battles that had the potential for serious injury or for death. And the same is true for us as we are reminded that God has given to us spiritual armor that we are to use as uh, we live our lives for him. As followers of Christ, we, we are given spiritual armor by which we can live our lives. And we realize that in this spiritual battle, there are many casualties. Sometimes or very often those casualties are as a result of the fact that there are individuals who have not yet become followers of Jesus and so as a result of that, they do not have the armor that God has prepared for them available to them because they're not followers of Jesus. That the armor that God gives to us is for those uh, who are followers of Jesus. It is for those who have trusted Christ. And so there are those who step out into a Christless eternity because they have never become followers of Jesus and they are separated from God forever and ever. Sometimes, even as we have become followers of Jesus, there are defeats in our own lives. There are spiritual battles that every single one of us in this room have been involved in, are involved in, and will be involved in. And the problem is that we stand or fall based on whether or not we use the armor that God has given to us. And we forget that this life is a spiritual battle. We think in terms of only what we see physically and don't think in terms of the fact that there's a spiritual war that is going on behind the scenes for the soul of every single person. We are approaching the last verses in a section in which uh, the Apostle Paul describes for us a spiritual battle that is taking place along with the armor that has been given to us in order that we might be able to stand. And as we look at these final instructions, there are some things that, that there, there is a segment that Paul points out for us in these verses that are not part of the spiritual armor. In fact, he refers to these, this aspect that is absolutely necessary for us, which is prayer. It is not a piece of armor, but it is to be used in conjunction with the armor with which we are given. And so this spiritual battle isn't just for us. It isn't just for our families. It is for the process in which we find ourselves. And so if we are going to win spiritual battles in which we are engaged, we must pray. The priority of prayer is given to us. And so if we are going to see people who have been held captive by the enemy come into a relationship with Jesus, it takes prayer. If we are to fulfill our mission as a church, it takes prayer. If we are to be those who win the spiritual battles, not on our own, it takes prayer. You see, it's possible for a soldier to have the very best of equipment, and it won't help in the battle if they don't uh, put it on or if they don't stand firm and in this section, Paul says, we need to make sure we add prayer to the process of our spiritual battles. It's the energy that enables us as followers of Jesus. And so I invite you to grab a Bible, turn to Ephesians uh, chapter 6, and we're going to get a run at the passage that we're going to look at this morning, which is going to be verses 18 to 20. But I want to back up and go back to verses 10 and begin in that particular, begin in that particular place. Because that sets for us uh, the understanding of, of why prayer is so important. 
And Paul writes, finally, and again, that's, this is in conclusion to everything that has taken place, everything that he has written in the book of Ephesians thus far as we come to the conclusion of the book of Ephesians. And uh, Lord willing, we'll finish that out at the end of October. Two, two more messages after today. Uh, and, and, and then we, Paul writes, finally, as a result of everything that's gone before, again, remembering the first three chapters deal with truth that they are theologically foundational for us to understand truth. And then they, in the final uh, three uh, chapters, four through six, it's how do we apply that truth. So this is an application, but Paul is saying, I want to summarize everything that has gone previous to this. Finally, so pay attention. Finally, he writes in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Again, this battle is... We are to be involved and we are to provide the energy and we to, are to participate, but it isn't based on our strength, which is a really good thing. That it, my battle isn't ultimately determinative by whether or not I am strong enough. It is determined by whether or not I stand in God's strength. And that's what makes the distinction and that is what makes the difference. And so Paul writes, be strong in the strength of his might. Well, God's strength is unfailing. So that when I fail in my spiritual battle, it isn't because God hasn't supplied the right amount of power, the right amount of strength. It's because I didn't stand in his strength. And then in verse 11, so we have our responsibility. The first piece is to stand in our strength. Secondly, in verse 11, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, the craftiness of the devil, the desire that the enemy wants to destroy you. We need to understand that. I so, saw this past week on a forum, somebody wrote, well, at least one thing we know about the, the, it's not a Christian, all right, not a Christian, but he was making this comment about certain other people, and his statement was, well, at least, at least the, the Satan is consistent, and I, ha, I just, you know, I had to write on there, yes, he's a liar and a thief and a murderer, he's consistent. The Bible tells us that. He wants to destroy us. He, he will tell us that our best way of living is living under his guise and under, but he takes us all the way back to Genesis. He's scheming. He's crafty. He knows when we are weak. He knows our, the areas in which to attack us. He knows the air, when, when, you know, oh, he doesn't play fair. He doesn't play by the Geneva Convention. It's like, ah, oh. They've been through a tough spot. Let me really attack them now. And sometimes you've been through a really good spot. And let's attack. So he's scheming and he's crafty. So we need the strength that God supplies and we need the armor that God supplies and put it on and, and wear it. And then in verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. That's where our struggle starts. Behind the scenes. I was just thinking about that. I was sitting over here listening to the praise team and, and, and just uh, I really appreciated what they had to share. And then, and then as I was reflecting on this verse, there was something that came to my mind. And that is that as the tensions that might occur in our marriage are because there's a behind the scenes tension. The enemy is seeking to destroy us. He's seeking to destroy what God has put together. You see, there's often times that I think the problem is Pam. <laughs> if she would just see things my way, it would solve the problem. And I am not suggesting that the devil is behind her. All right, all right. Don't go down that road. I will be homeless for a while. But the problem is me. And there's an enemy who wants to destroy our marriages. And he wants to do all that he can to destroy our marriages. And by the way, the same thing is true about you as you raise your children. 
You know, we think if my kids would just be a little more responsible, if they would do just a few more things, then everything would be fine. When we need to understand as parents, there is a spiritual battle for the souls of your children that are going on. And what you see exemplified through the rebellion and the no, especially at the, you know, terrible twos, terrible threes, and following. Okay, I heard an amen. (laughs) Is as a result of the fact that there's a spiritual battle going on. And so as parents, what we need to be able to do is to see through the fact that there is a spiritual battle for the soul of my child. And there's a spiritual battle for my soul as to how I'm going to respond to that particular situation. We need to move on. That's not where we're going to focus. Therefore, as a result of the fact that there is this spiritual battle that is taking place, verse 13, take up the full armor of God. Don't leave any pieces out. We need it all. And so there are six pieces that are listed for us. Take up the full armor of God uh, that you may be able to resist. You see it's possible for us to resist. You can circle that. I hope you're marking your Bibles. You might be able to resist. You will be able to resist. That you may be able to resist in the evil day. What's the evil day? It's when all hell breaks loose. When the enemy really attacks you. When he really comes after you. That's the evil day. And so you will be able to resist And having done everything, you're still standing. When the smoke clears of that spiritual battle that you are involved in, you are still standing, number one, because you stood in God's strength, and number two, because you put on the full armor of God. And then Paul lists it for us. Stand firm, having your loins girded or a belt on your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod, Uh, with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish, what's the next word? All. It doesn't say most. All. By which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That God's truth stands firm. And we've talked about this. We don't have time to go back and and go back over it. Uh, But the fact is, even as Jesus withstood the temptations of, of Satan, as Jesus was led out by the Holy Spirit to be tempted, he used scripture to respond. It is written. It is written. It is written. And you remember back in Genesis, Satan said, did God really say? Adam needed to say, it is written. He spoke. And so in verses 18 to 20 tells us that there is this priority of prayer that standing firm in the armor that you and I have that what we need then in order to be able to use it properly is prayer. Now I'm tempted to kind of say, go back and say, well, you know, this prayer is that which gives me strength. Um, Theologically, that might make a little sense. Grammatically, it does not because that's not what it's linked to. It's linked to the whole piece. And so there are, there, you know, looking at this, it's how, how do we outline this and, and make it in a way that's easy to follow? There are four alls that are in this particular section in verse 18. But I think what Paul does for us here is he gives to us two main thoughts. First, the, and this is the first main thought, right? Keep praying and keep alert. That's verse 18. And then there's a second main thought we find in verses 19 to 20, which is pray evangelistically. So the priority of prayer is given to us in verse 18. Let's break that down. Again, as we look at it, and I'm sorry if this is grammatically, I'm not trying to be difficult or look at that, um, but I think it helps us understand there are two main participles. They're present participles, which means we are to continue to do this. And then it is, there, there are modifiers of that. And so the first main participle that are, that's given to us is keep praying. And the second one is keep on the alert. So I think those are the two main things that Paul is saying for us. Keep praying. And we'll get to the second part of that. So he says in verse 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times. That's the keep praying. That's the participle. It's a present tense. Keep doing it. Keep doing it at all times in the spirit. Keep praying. Pray in the spirit. What does that mean? That's, that's not some sort of special prayer language that you have to have. That we talk to God in exactly the same way as we have communication with one another. You don't have to learn a different language. 
What does it mean to pray uh, by the Holy Spirit? It means to pray depending upon Him, to pray in, in coordination with the Holy Spirit. You know, if I would pray, Lord, turn my 2000 Ford Ranger into a brand new F-150. That is not praying in the Spirit. Oh, but I could tell a lot of people what you did. No, praying along with what God has for us, praying in, in coordination, conjunction with what God desires of us. And sometimes you probably have that experience where, you know, I, I need to stop and pray for somebody. And a name comes to your mind. You've been sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we, we pray depending upon the Holy Spirit. And then, and then it says with all prayer and petition. It means every possible way of, of praying. All, all supplication. Some of your King James has that in there. All kinds of prayer and all kinds of requests. And so we pray for others. And we pray for our family. And you can pray for yourself. That's legitimate. And you can pray for your friends. And you can pray for your church family. I'm, I, I'm just... I appreciate so much when some of you share uh, by way of church email, hey, pray for. It might be for yourself, it might be a family member, it might be. And then there's that aspect in which we are praying together. I was really encouraged last week as we spent some pre uh, time together as a church family praying and hearing different ones pray for needs within our family, within our community, and even around the world. And so we are challenged, pray. Pray. Remember, uh, part of that prayer, too, it's really the disciples' prayer. It's not Jesus' prayer. Jesus never prayed it, but, you know, our Father who art in heaven, God, you're just awesome. You're just an awesome God. You know, you get out and see some of the sunsets or the sunrise, or you see the changing of the leaves and the beauty that goes into that, and you think, man, that, that's just impressive. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. So prayer, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times means pray at every opportunity. It doesn't mean you sit in your house, uh, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year in your recliner or whatever it might be at the desk or kneeling, and that's how you pray. It doesn't mean that if some, hey, can I, hey, let's go out for dinner. Oh, I can't. I got to got to be here praying. It means at every opportunity. And so we pray. We pray for God's kingdom. We pray for daily needs. We pray for forgiveness. Every, uh, every aspect. And we, we, we weave prayer into every aspect of our lives. You might be taking your kids to school. And they mention someone, someone's sick, or something good that's happened, and hey, let's pray. There's a bully at school that's making life miserable. Let's pray. We don't know what's going on in his life. Let's pray. Let's pray for our teachers. Let's pray for our administration. Let's pray. You go through a checkout line, and somebody's just been given a lot of grief in front of you. And while you're watching, Lord, let, let's, let me just pray for that individual. Let me pray. I'm reminded, and you probably remember, in, in Exodus where uh, Moses and the Israelites' uh, nation is having a battle, and they're involved on, and in that as, uh, aspect, whenever Moses raised the uh, Amalekites is who they were fighting, whenever Moses raised his arms, Joshua and the army of Israel was successful. And whenever his arms came down, it was, it was an illustration of prayer. And so there were two individuals that came to help hold up the arms of, of Moses because it was hard. And to think in terms of the fact that as you pray for other individuals, there are things that take place in their lives. There are certain situations that occur. Prayer does change things. It makes a difference. So keep praying. Praying for all the saints. 
This isn't the generic, well, God bless all the missionaries and everybody. And it gets specific. It gets specific. Prayer changes things. What, what, what does prayer really do? It, it, call, it invites, let me put it that way, it invites God to do on earth what he's determined to do in heaven. So when Jesus said, you know, that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we, we in essence are inviting God to do on earth what he's already set aside in heaven. Remember Elijah on Mount Carmel? And it was called that, you know, it was instructed. There hadn't been any rain for a few years. And, and God said, it's going to rain. But then we read that Elijah bowed himself down. And we understand that to be an attitude of prayer. And it, he sent his servant to look. Ah, don't see anything yet. Come back, pray some more. Ah, go. Don't see anything yet. Come back, pray some more. And finally he said, you know, there's a cloud just about the size of a man's hand on the horizon. Elijah says, that's God's answer to prayer. So he told Ahab, get in your chariot and get out of here because we're going to have a tremendous thunderstorm that you, like we haven't seen for years. And Elijah packed up and he headed out as well. But here's the piece. Had Elijah not prayed, the rain would not have come. God had determined in heaven that he was going to send rain that day. But had Elijah not prayed, the rain would not have come. You see, that's ask, inviting God to do on earth what he is determined to do in heaven. That's a piece of it. So pray at all times. Secondly, the second part of this, this first uh, uh, verse, verse 18, is keep alert. Stay alert. Those of you who have been in the military understand this. It means like being a military sentry, being on guard. If you are out uh, amongst the enemy, you want to stay alert because you don't know when the enemy might be sending scouts into your camp. And so you remain on the alert looking for those things to happen. It, it is staying vigilant. And one of the ways that we stay vigilant is through prayer. And Paul says, you know, keep alert. And he says there, with all perseverance, don't quit. Don't quit. Pray in perseverance. It's just too easy to give up, isn't it? Well, I didn't see it happen. I've been praying for this for a few days, a few weeks, a few months, for years. There's some stories I could tell you of people who have prayed, and in one particular one I'm thinking about, prayed for an uncle for 30 or 40 years, and about four, at 80 years of age, this uncle came to know Jesus. Prayed for years. Didn't give up. And so the enemy knows that. He knows how to attack us. And so we must stay alert. Remember when Jesus uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's preparing to go to the cross. And uh, as he is there and he instructs his disciples, he said, I, look, I want you to watch and pray. Do you remember what he said? So you don't enter into temptation. So you don't enter into temptation. Watch and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. Jesus goes off a little ways, comes back, and they had fallen asleep. And frankly, I can identify with that. There have been times I've been praying, and the next thing is, oh my, look at, you know, what just happened in those spanning minutes. And as a result of that, they did enter into temptation and they failed the, spirit, failed the spiritual battle. Peter in particular, we can remember, but every, all the other ones, we're not just picking on Peter. John perhaps stood at a distance and kind of watched what was taking place, but that was about it. Romans 12, 12, and there are many other passages that say much the same thing. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. You know, we have this tendency to say, well, I guess nothing else has worked. I think I need to pray about it. No, that needs to be the first thing. The first thing. With all petition for all the saints. Again, all kinds of prayer. Asking God to carry out his plan on earth. 
for those who are going through difficult times, praying for others who are going through situations where we need to, they need to stay vigilant. And so we pray. And, and, and our faith isn't in prayer. Our faith is in the God behind the prayer. Understand that. You know, I have faith in prayer. No, I have faith in God. The story is told of, of, of some of the Knights of Charlemagne back in the Middle Ages and there was a particular commander, Roland. Uh, I, he was some relationship, I, I think, to Charlemagne. But anyway, he had taken his troops, and they were going through a very narrow pass at the Pyrenees. And there's a difference, a, a debate in history books about this. So, but the illustration, I think, is, is still very good. And so this Roland is going through this na- very narrow path, and he has this big horn that is called the Oliphant. And um, the idea was behind it that he could blow this horn when he had a need and when he blew the horn that there would be reinforcements that would come and would help him do the battle. Well, he's involved in this narrow pass and he's losing. But pride kept him from blowing that oliphant, from blowing the horn. He, he was afraid, you know, I, I can do this on my own. And he ended up being defeated. And friends, sometimes in our prayer, there's this tendency to say, well, you know, I don't need to share this with anybody else. I can do this on my own. And if you remember the shields that we were referred to last week, they were the two and a half by four foot shields that they would be next to each other by which the darts would be kept from destroying us. And so there was a sense of the need for one another. And so here is this aspect of, first of all, keep praying. Don't quit. And maybe some of you have felt like quitting because the answer didn't come. And maybe it won't come. But there are others you need to be praying for. And keep alert. Then Paul changes uh, his focus in verses 19 and 20. And he says, I I want you to pray. Paul says, I want you to pray for me evangelistically. In this particular uh, section, there are only two requests. But if you go to Colossians chapter 4, which is very similar to this, there are actually three in Colossians. And I, I think they're very powerful. And the first thing that Paul prays for, notice there in in verse 19. And pray on my behalf, let me just read the verses. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains and in uh, proclaiming it may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul is on his way to Rome to stand before Caesar and to give an account. So he is understanding that the opportunity is going to be there. But what he, noted, what he prays for in verse 19 is utterance. Or if you go over to Colossians, it's, it's the idea of clarity of speech. You see, when you and I seek to share Jesus with someone, this is what we need to be praying for, praying for clarity of speech. That the words that come out of my mouth might make sense. And so we pray for clarity of speech. That's the first thing. The second thing, and I find this fascinating that it comes from the Apostle Paul. He says, I pray for me that I might have boldness. And he says it twice. Same word used in two different ways or two different places. And so he says, uh, pray that I might have boldness, last part of verse 19, last part of verse 20, and that I may speak boldly. I'm going to present the gospel before Caesar and his household. Pray that I might be bold. Well, goodness, if the Apostle Paul needed prayer for being bold, I need prayer for being bold. And you do too. And so Paul says, here's what I want you to do. I I want you to pray for boldness that I'd be able to speak as I ought to speak, which again, I think helps us circle back to the clarity of speech that I might give the right words. And so as you pray, you pray for First of all, you pray, pray for clarity of speech. Secondly, we, you pray for boldness. And then there's a third one, and this is found in Colossians. Pray for opportunities. In Colossians, Paul puts it this way, pray for an open door. Pray for an open door. 
Paul didn't need to ask for that in Ephesians because he was looking forward to having this open door in, as he went to Caesar. But in Colossians, he says, pray that there would be opportunities to share the gospel. You see, that's the hard issue of the problem that we see around us in the world is that people don't know Jesus. Don't understand the spiritual battle that's taking place. So Paul says, pray for me that I might have clarity of speech, that I might have boldness, and that I might have opportunities to do what? Make known the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel. What's that mystery in a nutshell? It's the fact that you and I and every single person in this world are born separated from God, that sin separates us. It took place back in the garden, but it isn't all Adam's fault. I, I, I get a lot of credit for that too, you know? And, and the fact that we're born separated from God and we live lives that are separated from God and, and because God's holy, I'm not and you're not and nobody else is and so we don't have access to a holy God. And that the creator of the universe, seeing our predicament that we could not fix, stepped down from the glories of heaven and came down into our world, lived a life that we should have lived, went to the cross to pay for our sins and our failures, was buried because he really died, rose again on the third day to prove that God was satisfied with what he did and that there's life after life. It was God's stamp of approval on what Jesus did so that whoever puts their faith and trust in Christ might have eternal life. The mystery of the gospel. That the creator of the universe cares enough that you and I would have a relationship with him. The, we read in Scripture in the New Testament that the angels kind of, if I can use this uh, anthropomorphism, speaking in human terms, they scratch their head trying to figure out why in the world would God want to go down to save those people? Why would God want to save me? It's the mystery of the gospel, and it's called grace. And so Paul says, we've got a message of hope that the world desperately needs to hear. And so are you praying for clarity of speech, for boldness, and for opportunities? Who are you praying for? Who's on your list of individuals that doesn't yet know Jesus for whom you are praying these three things? We met as a team huddle. We often do on Tuesday. We meet together and kind of figure out what, you know, what, what really worked and what do we need to fix and those kinds of things and talk about ministry here among our staff and whatnot. And uh, I shared with him this past week, I said, you know, I've been thinking that over the past couple of, couple of weeks, I've not had an opportunity, maybe I've had the opportunity and missed it, but I, I haven't talked to anybody outside of our church family about Jesus, or even moved it just a little bit, maybe didn't get that far, but at least getting to know names and who they are and something about them to show some interest in their life. So that I might at some point in time have an opportunity to tell them about the mystery of the gospel. So that was rather convicting. And so I thought I'd share that with you to convict you. So you can join me. Now some of you work in an environment where you have those opportunities. And I hear your stories. And, and I'm grateful for it. I remember hearing a person kind of semi complaining, or uh, maybe that's not the right word, making the observation that he was the only Christian in, their pla in his place of employment, which was really, really hard to be a Christian in. So, man, you've got a tremendous opportunity. <laughs> now, it's easy for me sitting here. You know, Pastor Doug keeps it pretty clean most of the time, so... <laughs> So it's easier to, you know, in this environment. But I need to be out about sharing the gospel to looking for, praying for opportunities, being on mission. It's a mystery of the gospel. I've had a few grandparents sharing with me recently about the fact that they're concerned that they have grandchildren who are in an environment that are not hearing anything about 
who Jesus is, not hearing about the mystery of the gospel, not being challenged about walking with Christ. And so they're praying for grandkids, certainly praying for adult children, but praying for grandchildren who don't know Jesus and are not being raised in that environment and saying, you know, that's, I'm beginning praying even now, even now, that they might become followers of Jesus. You see, we are called to always pray about everything and stay alert and especially pray for the gospel. To pray about everything to stay alert, and especially to pray for the advancement of the gospel. And so that's the concluding part of Paul's challenge to us about facing the spiritual battles which we have. And so I challenge us, first of all, if you don't know what the mystery of the gospel is or haven't responded, be delighted uh, to sit down and share with you Somebody else, maybe you came with somebody, say, hey, what does it mean? So that you might become a follower of Jesus as well and, in, and walk with him. Secondly, I challenge us, pray for boldness, pray for, pray for clarity, pray for opportunity. Keep praying, stay alert, pray for the advancement of the gospel, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege that we have of knowing you, and we have the privilege of proclaiming to others, telling others what Jesus has done for us. Lord, we are involved in a spiritual battle, and we need to remember that. The enemy schemes to destroy us, destroy our homes, to destroy our marriages, and Lord, uh, we need to be reminded that you've given to us armor by which we can wear to withstand the enemy. Also, you have instructed us to stand firm, not stand down, but to stand firm, and then to pray, to pray. To pray for these situations that we are inviting you to carry out your mission on earth as you have determined it to be in heaven. Prayer really does make a difference. And so, as followers of Jesus, we need to pray, always pray, about everything, stay alert and pray for the advancement of the gospel. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.